So this month we're going to start looking at how to do audio programming from C++. And the first library we're going to look at is a library called Base. And Base is a library I haven't used but I've been aware of for quite some time because um, it is one of the few libraries out there that supports playing back so-called mod music or tracker music and you might not be familiar with what tracker music is it's comes from early PC gaming and the idea is that when you compose the music you compose a series of patterns where each pattern is up to 64 notes and then you have an order list that uh, orders the patterns in a sequence so you might have uh, you know uh, a couple of patterns that go together and then you order them repeatedly after another to get a kind of a continuous background representation or, or background score going and it's a very compact way to represent a musical score which is what you needed on early microcomputers right so um, the reason that that interested me is because uh, there's a underground art scene called the demo scene where people have combined uh, you know, it's like a demonstration of your programming skills by doing a little kind of audio visual presentation and so usually it's a combination of somebody who is a musician that creates a tracker score for the demo and a visual effects programmer that makes visual effects that are uh, keyed to the music score and they operate in tandem so what you want is a library that can play back this music score and can notify you when events happen on the score for instance when you finish a pattern and then change to the next pattern or when you're going from note to note within a pattern you would like to have that come back to your code as an event or something like that that you can react against so that you can time the graphics effects against what's happening in the score. Now you can always just play back an mp3 file and manually make note of the timestamps but even in that case you still need to know where you are in the playback of the mp3 file in order to synchronize the timestamps in the music with what's going on in the effects. So um, this base library has been around for quite a while. Now it is a free library but it is not an open source library. If we go over to their website there's binary downloads for Linux, Mac, and Windows but there's no source code. It's not hosted on GitHub. It's, it uh, has a commercial license but it's free for non-commercial use which is one of the things that makes it popular in the demo scene community so um, you know and you know single commercial license for 950 euros I, I don't know how expensive or cheap that is compared to other sound libraries because I haven't priced them out uh, and another thing that makes a uh, base interesting is it has a an extension plugin mechanism and so there's a bunch of add-ons here. Most of them are for adding new codecs. So a codec is a coder decoder for the various music formats, uh, stream formats, being able to um, stream live via HTTP isn't you know an ex one of the extensions. And um, there's also some more encoders and decoders uh, where did they have it there was also they had some additional add-on encoders here they are okay so encode mp3 so you can not only play back with bass but you can also record with bass um, the distribution just comes as a zip file it has a um, HTML help 
file the shared library and then inside the C folder is the header file and the import library that you would link against it's uh, I didn't try out the Linux distribution but the Linux distribution similarly has a header file and an SO um, and in the in this uh, C folder they have a bunch of uh, sample programs which we will look at so let's go over and look at their uh, their help so basically like most libraries you're gonna initialize the library for use and if you get into advanced audio programming there's a lot of options that you have first of all there are uh, can be multiple output devices attached to your computer I mean on my computer I have my headphones I have my speakers I have a little USB XLR uh, audio box for attaching an XLR microphone doesn't happen to be the microphone I'm using right now I'm using the microphone on my headset so that's uh, it's got two XLR inputs on that little USB audio box and it also has the ability has a headphone jack so there's audio output through that USB box um, there's the speakers that are attached to the uh, jacks on the back of my machine there is uh, output from the monitors that I have they have a crappy little speaker inside each monitor I have two monitors and I have my headphones plugged into the front so there's any number of output devices that I could use and there's at least two different input devices I could use I think the the uh, little XLR USB box because it has a microphone XLR input and a second XLR input that is intended for like a guitar or something like that so it's got two inputs um, and one output so any number of devices that you may talk to and then each of those devices has their own audio characteristics so you may have a single device expose you know a 5.1 or a 7.1 sound system or maybe it's stereo or maybe it's mono the audio data itself can be encoded in a variety of uh, formats and when you break it down for use in the computer it will ultimately come down to some bit resolution is that going to be 8 bits per channel is going to be 16 bits per channel is going to be 24 bits per channel um, and as we mentioned there's each device can have multiple channels and so on so um, the way base works is that although it can talk to multiple devices at any particular moment uh, each thread has the concept of a current device so after you initialize base and in this case you initialize it for a particular device if you want to initialize multiple devices and switch between them you set device to make um, the device relevant API calls after a call to set device will affect the device that has been set as current so there's the concept of a current device and these setters have corresponding getters so there's a get device that gets the current device that is used by this thread so after you deal with devices you next have to deal with what's in if you're doing playback you have to deal with what's in the thing that you're playing back and bass can deal with uh, samples streams and mod music and the one um, that I was most interested in was this mod music form where you know you're basically pointing it at a file and opening up um, one of these chiptune music files and getting all the data structures in base set up for um, playing back that file now there's a bunch of options I mean this this API is very rich I'm not going to go into all the details of this API because uh, we'd be here all night I'm just going to go over like the high points but and we're going to look at some of the the samples that come with it that will make it more obvious 
So um, you open up a music file and you get back a handle to a music. If you open up a stream, we can create a stream from a file or you can create a stream from a URL. So if you create a stream from a URL, it gives you the ability to, you know, receive that stream over a network socket or something like that. Those, all the methods of opening a stream return a handle to a stream. If you open <coughs> a sample, you get a handle to a sample. All of those things end up being used as inputs to the functions that operate on channels. So a channel um, is either it's a sample stream or a sample it's sorry it's a handle to a stream or a handle to a music a mod mod, the mod music the so-called chiptune or a recording uh, so you can get a channel that's created by starting a recording you can get a channel by opening one of these streams um, you can get a channel from a sample and get uh, a channel back or you can get um, a channel by <coughs> loading a mod music and channels are really the uh, the main chunk of the API as you can see here from the number of function calls that relate to samples or sorry to channels now it looks a little bit intimidating but remember that <coughs> for all the changeable attributes of a channel there's going to be a getter in this case setting 3d attributes sorry a setter and a getter so kind of looks like there's a ton of functions here but really there's a bunch of them that are changing these attributes that are gets and sets uh, there's a couple queries that are just pure gets you know is the channel active is it sliding there's actions like play pause and stop and one of the interesting things about base as I said is this ability to um, get notifications from the audio library as different events happen during playback and you do that you get that uh, notification by using a sync proc so this is your application is being synchronized to things that happen in the audio and if we scroll down here and look at the kinds of things that we can sync on let me make this bigger one of the for for mod music which is the main thing that got me looking at this library you can synchronize on when the sync effect is used in um, tracker music or when uh, sync when an instrument is played and if we look down in here in the detail you can find out the note and the volume that is being played uh, when your synchronization callback is invoked now they're describing this as so there's the handle this is whatever you're synchronizing on there's the type of synchronization that you want which is each of these enums and then there's a parameter which is kind of a detail specifying more information about the type of synchronization you want to perform so this uh, sync on musical instrument you tell it which instrument you want to sync on and um, which note you want to sync on and you notice like if, if you pass in minus one for the note that is that is synchronized on all the notes and then when the callback is invoked the data parameter to your callback will contain the note and the volume of that note now to me what's interesting about this is you can say hey maybe I want to do a, view, a, a, a visual effect that is synchronized every time the bass drum in the drum kit is played so every time the bass drum pedal in the drum kit is played I want to have some visual effect go on maybe like a flash on the screen or something and the the advantage of specifying the synchronization this way is that 
it, you're you're doing it's a team effort you're collaborating with the musician the musician may revise and change the score as you're working on this demo together you don't want to have to recode all your effects just because they changed the score and they changed you know where the the bass drum beats come in so if you synchronize on the instrument saying the bass drum and maybe you don't care about which note because maybe you know it's just the bass drum so this is only really one but you if it were something like a clarinet you could synchronize on particular notes of the clarinet and so on but by attaching yourself directly to synchronizing on what's happening on the score as opposed to what's happening on a timestamp in an mp3 file you have a, a layer of abstraction between your visual effect and how it is keyed off of the audio track so to me that's what got me interested in this library is because this is kind of the um, signature style in these demo scene demos is to have a musical score and have visual effects that are triggered off of the score so really the musical score is driving the visual effects and if we have a synchronization mechanism that lets us tie our notifications to what's happening in the musical score then we're abstracted from the fact that it's just you know in an mp3 file we don't have any notion of the score we just have audio samples that are being played back in time and if the musician changes everything now I have to go update all the timestamps where all my visual effects are triggered and it's very manual so this is more to me this is more interesting uh, additionally you can synchronize on the music position and uh, when we looked at this description of what a chiptune looks like in terms of its file structure it's a pattern it's a bank of patterns and then there's a list that is called the order list that describes the order in which the patterns are played back from that bank so in this music position synchronization that's why they describe it here as the low word of the parameter is which order you're going to sync on which could be all of them and which row you're going to sync on within the orders and again that could be all of them so why would you want to synchronize on a particular row well these rows represent um, portions you know equal time slices within the pattern so if I synchronize on the first row or row 10 or you know this is 10 hex by the way if I sync in this diagram if I synchronize on row 10 uh, or what have you that could be you know a particular location within the beat structure of my music that happens at the same relative time within each bar or, or, or section of these uh, patterns so um, that's why you might want to synchronize on a particular row remember this param description here is describing the additional data that we pass to the API when we're telling it how we want to sync uh, and then when the callback is invoked the low word of this data parameter the low word is the order and the high word is the row so if we said give me all the orders and all the rows we will see this change as we walk through the order list that is determining the playback of the patterns in the pattern bank um, it, and this is these are the the sync types that are relevant for you know mod music but you can also sync on um, position within a, a stream and that gives you the position in bytes which you think might not be particularly useful but they have a function called bytes to seconds where you give it the byte position and it gives you back a floating point number representing the time in seconds since the beginning of the stream so you can translate back and forth between the bytes that come back from this uh, when you're synchronizing against a stream two seconds um, there's also additional sync 
options in here. You can you can you know sync when you know metadata is received on a shoutcast stream or when the playback of the channel has been stalled uh, or you know various other events that happen in here like it you know it, when the channel reach it reach the end including looping and so on so from my perspective this was what got me interested in this because a I could use it to play back these um, chiptune formats it supports all the common formats that are in use so different musicians have different tracker software that they like and those different tracker software the tracker software being the stuff that gives you this kind of a view that the the, uh, the tracker software is the authoring software for a chiptune file format so um, different musicians have their different tracker software that that they like to use that they're very you know productive in so the fact that this library could handle all the different kinds of tracker formats makes it appealing because then you don't have to constrain your musician you can the musician can work in whatever software they like best and another interesting feature of this library is that it can provide 3d effects on sound channels so what exactly does that mean well obviously if I'm doing a 3d game or a th some kind of 3d demo the listener is located somewhere in space and they're in a an active environment with sound sources in the environment and those sound sources are located somewhere relative to the listener and if a, if a sound source is far away then its volume is diminished compared to a sound source that is close to the listener if a sound source is moving relative to the listener then that depending on the distance between the two the the volume of that sound source is going to increase or decrease and for a very fast moving sound source you're going to have a doppler effect uh, the doppler effect most people are more are familiar with it if you've if you've heard a train go by when it's blasting its horn and you were close to the tracks you hear the change in pitch of the trains horn as it approaches you and as it leaves you and that's due to the Doppler effect of the speed of the train relative to the speed of sound the faster the train moves then the more enhanced the Doppler effect namely the the shift in the perceived sh shift in pitch of the sound of the trains horn as it approaches you and as it it leaves so um, in bass they have a full 3d system that can handle that so you can have in a game for instance you can have sound effects of active elements in the environment that are changing their volume as you approach them or as you get farther away from them and mo objects that are moving in the environment relative to the listener are also going to have their relative uh, volume changed uh, and there's a little demo that we're going to look at later that will show how this works uh, in, or how it sounds rather um, but I found this also to be pretty interesting because you know now we're getting um, kind of a higher level of audio processing than just encoding and decoding file formats and playing back sound on a device so something like um, this 3d processing I wouldn't want to have to do that on my own I certainly could I mean I can you can drop down to you know first principles physics and work out all the formulas and do all the math and everything but boy what a giant pain if you had to do that all by yourself so the fact that this library can take care of that for you is very handy um, another thing that you might want to do while playing back sounds is you might want to play or you might want to apply digital signal processing effects to a channel uh, while you're playing it back and this is the remove function this is the the setter um, let me go back here and look at the I didn't show you when we were looking at uh, the synchronization stuff I didn't show you the signature of the callback function this is what the callback function looks like and in the description of the various 
uh, synchronization types they were describing the data parameter so that's the the data parameter you get a handle to the thing that's being synchronized which channel it is that the sync is occurring on for instance a mod music file which is represented by a single handle it can have multiple channels in it you know 4 16 what have you so within a mod file you might have four channels the four channels are associated with four instruments each one of those instruments has its own pattern bank and its own order list and you are synchronizing um, on the, on those different channels at di different times and the uh, the detailed data that comes back is telling you you know which order was it which note within the order and so on the void star argument here is your standard void star that you pass into a callback API when you register the callback and it it doesn't it doesn't use it as the internals of the API don't use it it just passes it forward to your callback routine so you can establish a context in C++ this is most commonly what you're really doing is having this void star be a pointer to an instance of an object and the callback function is a C style API and the very first thing it does is cast this context to the right type of your instance and then invoke a method on it so you've got a way to uh, have the synchronization callback sync back to a particular instance of an object and not just one global function that deals with everything um, so we're moving on next to uh, digital signal processing that you might want to perform on a channel so the same callback mechanism is available here and the difference here is that for digital signal processing you need access to the raw samples and so that's this buffer and length that are being passed in and notice that the buffer is not const because what you're going to do is modify the buffer with your digital signal processing effect and so here they show you know a simple example that swaps the left and right um, channels of a stereo of a 16-bit stereo channel so because it's 16-bit they are representing the buffer as an array of shorts a short being 16 bits you know in um, modern C++ terms you might say std uint 16 or something like that or std int 16 depending on if you want signed or unsigned and then um, they're just swapping the left and right as they walk over the buffer and they're advancing the buffer by two samples um, at a time um, so you get access to processing of the raw samples if you want to go down to that level um, you can also okay so um, channels have attributes that are specific to whether it's you know a music or a stream or just a music or maybe it might apply also to a recording so these attributes can be get and set as appropriate for specifying details of what you want to do for instance you can set the volume level of a particular channel in a mod music as opposed to the uh, the global volume level um, you can set the volume level of an instrument or a sample. Uh, so in mod music form, the instruments are usually represented as a table of samples. And then the patterns are combination of instruments and notes. And then the order list is the order in which the patterns are played back. So let's take a look at some code here uh, I've got oops. all right so let's look um, 
Let's look over here first. So here's a simple... So all these... Let me go back over here. All these uh, programs that we're going to look like look at came in the base distribution. Now these are the Windows dem uh, demos. I didn't check to see uh, what the demos look like in the Linux distribution, if it's if it's one to one or or not. I mean, some of these, you know, they have a Windows resource file to build a little dialog. Um, so this first one, base test. Let's make this the active project, or the startup project. Let me do this. Uh, so base test. Um, a lot of these demos, they just follow the the, the the same pattern. The first thing they do is check that the version obtained from the DLL is the same version that the program was compiled against. So if we drill into this, it comes from the header that we're compiling against. So this is version 2.4. And then this function gets the full version from the DLL, which is major minor patch and revision so it's got four fields in it which is why they extract off high word from that full version and this is just a simple way to make sure that the code that we're getting at runtime is the code that we expect it to be using at compile time so all these samples they do that check first and that this is just initializing the Windows Common Controls Library and then they instantiate a dialog box and then all the interesting part of the samples happens in the event loop for the dialog box so in this case they're firing off a timer that's periodically going to update um, something in the dialog during playback in this case they're just updating how much uh, CPU usage is being utilized by the audio library. So if we go back here, uh, get CPU, the base CPU uh, usage as a percentage. So if you're doing a real-time graphics demo with an associated audio track, you don't want your audio library to be chewing up a huge chunk of your runtime because you're trying to do real-time playback and you're trying to you know have things be fluid at a, preferably like a very constant or predictable frame rate um, and we'll see when we run this that that base doesn't use very much CPU at all at least not on my machine obviously if I had a weaker machine it would use more CPU as a percentage and then the most of the interesting things that happen in these demos are in the command uh, event processing so um, here you know we're creating a stream from a file if we're going to play back a stream let's just run it to give you an idea what this looks like okay so it can play back streams it can play back mod music or it can play samples so if we add a mod music I've got one here that I downloaded off the internet and if we play this uh, let's make sure that my can you guys hear anything I don't hear anything locally let's try this is it this to headphones Let's try you this. I had a feeling that somebody was going to be interfering with my audio during this presentation. Um, audio settings.
Wow, Jitsi. It shows me a little test button and then doesn't let me click on it. <laughs> That's not a helpful UI. Let's try this again. Let's go back over here. Audio to speakers. Oops, add. Nope, it's not cooperating. I don't, I assume you guys don't hear anything. I don't hear anything when I play back either, which is consistent, but not helpful. Share audio. This is going to certainly put a cramp in all the demoing, isn't it? Hmm. Let's try this one. Okay, so... Ah! Did you hear that? Yep. All right. So let me put this on headphones. All right. Okay. You can hear that. And you'll see in here, let me pause this. You see this, it says I-040-028. Did you stop sharing the screen? Hold on. No. My screen is still sharing. It's just Jitsi is being annoying. Okay. So... Let's go look at the code for this sample. So in mod test, it's similar to base test. It, it's just playing back a file. But in this case, um, I've modified this sample so that after we select something to play, I wrote this little sync function that does a uh, sync on music effects, sync on music instrument, and music position and for those last two I'm passing in the data parameter sorry the param parameter that specifies I'm interested in everything and all I'm doing when these sync events happen is I am grabbing the decoded data parameter and I'm shoving that information into a, a single static struct I'm getting indication that my nobody can see me anymore. Um, it's just jitsy goofing because my screen is still shared. So I said share audio, share video. Oh, that's not it. on just a moment oh it thankfully it turned off my screen sharing that was lame all right how about now
I told it to share the audio with my screen. All right, let's try this again. So if I run the program, open the mod file, can you hear that? Okay. Yay, technical software. Okay, so if we pause this, I because I updated this, uh, I added these sync callbacks, and it's it's synchronizing on all of these and shoving the detailed information from the sync notification into this global structure, and then when the timer goes off, I'm just taking in this case which note and which volume, or the volume of the note that is being played back from an instrument, I'm displaying that in this little this tiny little text box so at the moment that I've paused it it's saying it's instrument 44 and note 24 so as I continue you'll see that these are changing as the different instruments play and if I switch this so that it's not that it's the position. I'll just change this to a P so we know that's what's happening. Build and run this again. Open this file. And it starts playing back. And so it, this is the order and then the note within the order. So as we're progressing down the score, I don't know if you noticed it, switched order when it got up to 63. And that's because each order has 64 notes. So this is progressing kind of linearly as we work through this file. I can scrub. And this goes back to our little description here of how a chiptune file is organized. We were going down one of these patterns and then advancing to the next pattern as we played 64 notes. We advance to the next pattern and next pattern and next pattern and so on. Now if your score doesn't have repeating chunks, you're just going to have a sequence of linearly increasing orders as the playback continues. Um, this particular score I haven't analyzed it to find out as we just scrub along looks like it's just going to increase linearly so it, in that case it didn't have repeating segments which you know it's kind of to be expected if you want to create a piece of interesting music right it's the the song is going to progress until we're done but if we're in a video game context or in a in a demo scene demo context you might have some elements that are repeating and then the orders would repeat as well so this originally was just showing the uh, playback time in seconds as we were advancing through the playback of the mod music here it's you know getting doing a get position and and then it would print you know the um, time in seconds as it was progressing through but I hacked it up so that I could invoke the sync functions which is the part that I was interested in get the capture the sync data and then just show that uh, in the little display so let's now look at one of the other interesting features of this library which is the 3d part uh, so if we set this as the startup and run this, okay, so now we'll add a channel. Um, let's go up here. We'll take a different one. Oh, it has to be, ha, for the 3D it has to be a It didn't allow mp3 so it either need to be wave or a mod format so we'll take the mod file 
I'm not sure if that's a restriction on the library or just on this dem on this demo. <clears throat> um, we'll add a second one in. Now for the first one, we'll set its movement uh, to be 20 in one direction. And for this one, we'll set the movement to be 40 in the other direction. And so this dot in the center represents the location of the listener. So if we play this, you can hear that the this the sound increases as we get closer to the listener. This is the one channel is playing. Now we can add the second channel playing. You can hear that Doppler factor. We can reduce the roll-off factor so it's not as quiet when it's farther away. So it gives you an idea of, I mean, this is a simple 2D visualization, but it's a, it's a three-dimensional effect. Um, that gives you an idea of what that 3D effects processing looks like. Um, there's also an example here of the digital signal processing. So we can run this. It has, uh, let's look at the code first so we just get an idea for that. They have a simple rotate effect. This is um, making the sound appear as if it is uh, rotating between the two channels. So that's why they are doing sine on the first sample and then cosine on the second sample. And they're advancing two samples at a time. This uh, demo assumes a stereo uh, input. And then an echo effect here and a flanging effect here. I'm not an audio expert on these effects. I'm familiar with their names, but I'm not uh, familiar with the mathematics to explain how the mathematics achieves that acoustical effect. But those are the three effects that are supported by this sample. And if we look down in here, um, this is a pretty common idiom for these demos that are meant to work with either an mp3 style file or a mod music file. First it'll try to open it as a, as a stream and then if that fails it'll try to open it as music. After um, the file is loaded it'll begin playing the channels and when you toggle the checkboxes it will call set DSB with the appropriate callback uh, for the effect that was checked or unchecked. If it was unchecked, then it removes that DSP callback. Um, and it removes it by specifying the... the res so when you set the DSP callback, it gives you back a handle to that um, callback routine, and that's what you use to remove that particular callback routine. So if we run this guy, it'll ask me to open a file. And in this time, it can be either an MP3 or um, a music file. So this time, we'll open an MP3. And if we turn rotate on, I, I'm listening in headphones, and I can hear it bouncing back and forth between channels. You can have echo or flanger so pretty wide range of processing that you can apply with this library from the 3D processing the uh, DSP effects and obviously all the normal things you expect like volume control and pause and stop and play um, but I think the thing that makes this interesting, this library most interesting from an audio playback perspective is the its ability to glue you in to the music score from a chiptune playback. So 
that's what made it interesting to me. I think that's going to stand out as a unique feature of this library when we go and look at uh, some more audio processing libraries in the coming months. Um, I found these samples to be, we didn't look at them all, we looked at a few of them. I found them to be very useful in uh, showing how to use the library to achieve different specific use cases. And the documentation is pretty complete, uh, you know, and well, very complete, not just pretty complete, but every API um, method and structure and callback is documented in here. Now this is obviously a reference, but in the remarks there's lots of useful information about how one API call relates to another API call so you can see how these groups of API calls work together. Um, this library is thread safe but it operates by creating a separate thread for audio playback. So um, be aware of that you know in your programming if you're doing something with it that because it has a concurrent thread for audio playback that's how it's able to obtain the ability for your code to do whatever while the audio continues playing. It continues playing until you tell it to stop or pause. So obviously that's a, a bit of concurrency that you need to be aware of when you're programming with it. Um, this again is just a reference um, it's a complete reference and while that's good and and the, the the documentation for the function you know tells you you know go look at these other things that are related as you're reading the documentation for a particular function you might get a little bit lost as like you know how do I start and how do I achieve a particular use case and that's filled in by these samples now these samples I made a little um, CMake list.txt here and I wrote a little a little find base that locates the library creates uh, a target base column base that you can link against that will specify the appropriate include directories and all like that um, I hacked it up for 64-bit Windows version there's a 32-bit Windows version and I believe in the Linux distribution it has 32 and 64-bit shared objects as well um, and I wrote you know a little CMake function to add these uh, samples they were all pretty much the same they had a single source file with an optional resource script associated with the sample um, some of them were console applications so I just add a little function that created it as a console application instead of as a Win32 application. That's all my creation that did not come with uh, the base library. What comes with their library is um, some projects, a make, uh, Visual Studio projects, a make file, and a Visual Studio solution. I didn't bother to load this at all because in a, a I wanted to see what it was going to take to get it accessible from CMake and I just wrote a simple console application that all I did was get the base version and that just let me write a simple program that would be guaranteed to import something from their shared library and call it correctly to make sure that um, all my CMake stuff was written correctly. So. all these other samples here those are the ones that came with the base distribution and um, so this base test simple playback contest was a simple playback at using a console application uh, custom loop this one was uh, oh okay so this one's kind of interesting let's take a look at this custom loop you run it load a file for playback and then with the mouse sorry 
you can specify portions of the file for playback, for looping rather. So let's go to a quieter part. So as it gets to the yellow line, it loops back to the blue line. And that is uh, allowing you to do custom looped playback of um, something that, you know, where the original sound file didn't describe any looping behavior, but you're taking a segment of the original sound file and looping it yourself. Um, DevList is just a simple program that en enumerates all the audio devices on your system and prints them out. DSP test we looked at, uh, FX test, uh, simple effects. Okay, so within base, we didn't discuss this. We can take a look at this really quick. On a channel, not only can you set a digital signal processing uh, procedure that can be invoked on the raw samples, you can also set a particular effect. So these are, you can think of these as kind of canned digital signal processing recipes that are implemented by base. So um, these are mentioned in terms of DX8, that's DirectX 8. So DX8 effects are Windows feature requiring DirectX 8 or DirectX 9. Um, and on other platforms, they are emulated by base, except for three that they haven't written any emulation for. But these are um, other audio effects that you can apply to a channel that are directly, you know, so here's a flanger effect that you can apply. Here's the parameters that are affecting um, the flanger effect on that channel. FX set parameters, you give it the effect and the parameters. So when we, when we set an effects on some channel, whether it's a stream, a music, or a recording, we get back a handle to the effects object, and then from using that effects object, you can set the parameters. Um, and you'll notice here there's a priority argument, and um, the priority argument determines if you have multiple effects going on, so you could have echo, distortion, and flanger all being applied to the same channel. The priority specifies the order in which those effects are applied so that they're combined in a consistent manner. And um, so you can think of these effects as just kind of canned DSP recipes if you don't want to uh, do your own DSP processing. Um, so that was FX test shows you how that works. Uh, live FX. Full duplex example. Not sure what this one does. I am not an audio expert, just kind of an amateur. Live spectrum analyzer. We can take a look at that one. So it's doing a spectrum analysis of my input device, which is me talking. So it's it's doing spectrum analysis of a live input source. Uh, so live effects must be applying an effect to um, a live input source. Mod test is the playback of mod music. Uh, Net radio plays back from a stream on the network. Uh, rec test is recording test. Speakers uh, recording test is just showing an example of how to use recording from a microphone or other source. Uh, this is a multi-speaker example. Uh, this is going to be spectrum analyzer of a file, I suppose. Let's try that one. Yes. Um, synth is a simple synthesizer. So in this case, 
they are creating a stream on the fly by using a uh, this is base stream create so it's creating a stream from a callback the callback is invoked to create the samples that make up the stream so here their callback procedure is synthesizing um, the samples that will go into the buffer and you know it's a simple um, synthesizer here so they're using a uh, pow function and a sign you know modulated sine wave to create the samples uh, right wave this is going to be an example of how to take a sound source and write it out as a wave file yep so it's going to this is one is going to use the load additional plugins for additional file format support creates the file oh look it's it's creating the wave file by writing out as like raw f write that's kind of interesting <laughs> so it's not going through a, a codec to create the wave file they're just using their knowledge of the wave uh, format if you dig into Windows multimedia formats, you'll find out that they are basically RIF files, which is resource interchange file format. And that file format is a so-called chunked encoding with each chunk having a four character code identifier file preceding the data for that chunk. So this is the chunk saying what happens is this identifying this chunk as a wave chunk and then this FMT space is the chunk that identifies the format of the wave which I assume is going to be representing a series of raw samples and then the data chunk um, is going to uh, indicate the beginning of the data and then as they get the raw data from the channels they're just going to F write it into the output file and once all the data has been written then this will be the end of the file and the, and then oh it looks like down here they write out the last few little chunks of data that represent the complete size of the chunk so kind of interesting that they did it raw with f write and their knowledge of the wave file format instead of using a, a codec i mean it's certainly uh, a way that's guaranteed to work but um, as we saw, there was all those add-ons for adding different encoders and decoders that might be a preferred way to operate instead of writing out raw data with fwrite. But that pretty much sums up our presentation for the base library. So in the chat, there's a question, is there an example that shows the first use case you mentioned where inventions are fired at a certain time in the audio? So that was, I modified the mod test playback example. So we'll run it again in the in the unmodified demo or sample rather it's just showing the timestamp here in this text box but I've modified it to show the position so P is this position this first number is the order and then the second number is the note within the order so you can see this note is increasing from 0 to 63 and then we advance to the next order is the next pattern in the order list to be more specific um, so that's the example modified for that use case of I'm getting notification at, uh, of when the audio playback has reached certain points in the score and then I can use that information to trigger my audio effects or my visual effects from the audio. So, um, do we have any other questions before we wrap it up? Either in chat or by voice is fine. Uh, question in the chat was, I have the sample code here, can you highlight that code? Sure. 
it's in the mod test sample and my modifications I wrote this sync function before they call channel play on the music that they've loaded I call sync to register my sync functions so there's two places where they call uh, channel play and I added this uh, sync function to sync on the music and originally I was thinking I was going to have it send a message to the window but I, I, I didn't end up doing it that way I just ended up having the sync callbacks scribble it into a global data structure and then just have the timer processing on the window update the text box with the data from that global struct so everything you see here that is highlighted this is all code that I added so I have a little structure for this global data the two bits of data from the FX sync the two bits of data from the instrument sync and the two bits of data from the uh, position sync and then the FX sync callback decodes the data shoves it into that global struct same for the instrument sync callback and same for the position sync callback and then this sync function that I wrote registers those three callbacks with the music right before we play uh, the music file that's been loaded so those are my changes to this sample and obviously I changed this this uh, sprintf for the text that gets put into the text box uh, does that answer your question Mike okay uh, any other questions okay then we will end it here